hello to the next session here. Okay, thank yeah. you very much for putting on your headphones because this is a, the silent, um, the silent stage here, and um, I'm I'm very happy to have um, a very special person here at our stage. This is um, well, I, 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 I tried, I try, I try, I try. Katarzyna Szymilewicz from and she's um, she's from Poland and she is a human rights lawyer and um, activist in um, uh, I'm sorry and an activist and um, and co-founder and president of Panepticum and she's also vice president of um, the European digital rights movement and um, she will tell us um, about why you should you know who has been asking about you and I'm um, yeah I just uh, give the phone over to you and um, the stage is yours and I'm very interested in what you are talking about so go <laughs> thank, on thank you so much it sounds all very complicated I hope I will manage to make it easier for you in this uh, 30 minutes we have I must confess I never ever had that opportunity of speaking with my with headphones on head, headphones on my ears so it feels really funny uh, anyway be, before I take you in the topic and before I maybe explain this a bit uh, uh, a bit nasty title, a bit arrogant title. Let me take one more minute to explain uh, where I come from. Oops. Technical difficulty. Yeah, works. To explain a bit my background and where I come from and why I'm talking about what I will talk uh, here today. So Panopticon Foundation uh, is a Polish NGO, we work in Poland, but we basically work on international levels because our major mission, our focus is human rights in the context of surveillance. And surveillance, as you know perfectly well by now, it's something that doesn't really recognize borders. So recently we have been quite busy, but even without Mr. Snowden and his revelations, we have been quite busy doing basically two things. On one hand, we work with politicians. We try to influence the laws, be that in Poland or on the EU level in Brussels, in order to introduce more safeguards to, to protect human rights in the context of surveillance, both from public and private players, because we don't discriminate. We think that both sorts of surveillance are, uh, well, can be wrong, can be legitimate, but it's complicated. On the other hand, we work with people more directly. We engage in education, in awareness rising, in various campaigns. We promote tools like tactical technology, collective tools. Uh, we give them to people and we explain why they should actually uh, take care and, uh, and take time to protect themselves from surveillance. So that's Panopticon. But we're also part of something much bigger, which is European Digital Rights, a coalition of more than 30 organizations doing a very similar job all around Europe. Um, if you want to hear about any of this later, I'm here to talk to you and feel free to, to, to grab me. Today I will tell you only about one small piece of that work. Uh, in fact, uh, I would like to take you for a walk to a very weird place, to the place where the internet means, meets the law enforcement and intelligence. I'm quite sure that you've been to that place, even if you don't realize that. Uh, so essentially, state authorities like police, secret services, tax authorities, they have the right to, to check your online data. They have the right to request data from internet companies. It's legal in most of the countries, if not uh, all the countries I know. But not in every country. These things happen in a transparent way. Not always they happen for good reasons and not always they are kept within the boundaries of what we would um, see as legitimate, uh, we uh, as citizens. And therefore, I would say this is quite, quite a, a wide place. Uh, you can use your own imagination to try to place on that picture where you would see law enforcement, internet users and internet companies. I will not impose anything here. But just one point I want to make is that this is a quite uncharted territory. And we still know much less than we think we know. And therefore, there is a lot of space for imagination. Uh, well, I bet that many of you feel that you have actually learned quite a lot about this area uh, through Snowden revelations. 
Um, these little graphs you see here are from NSA Observatory created by La Corature du Net, our friendly uh, organization from France. And they did excellent job in, in data mining the, the, the Snowden files in order to identify many programs and many tools used by NSA, like Prism, Tempora, Upstream, Bullrun, all these names I hope ring a bell to you. We could spend half an hour just bringing up these names. But so having so much data, do we really know what's going on? My feeling and my, my, my personal worry is that not really. The key questions still remain unanswered. So even if we know that certain programs exist, we still don't know who is using them exactly, to what extent they are being used by European intelligence, to what extent our governments are, are involved, what sorts of data in particular are being collected, how deep they go, who really is the target. All these extremely relevant questions, they remain unanswered. And this is basically why I still prefer the jungle uh, as a metaphor of where we are now, because we are lost in a matrix of surveillance. And we are being left here by both private and public players, not without a reason. My point, and uh, what I argue today, is that we shouldn't tolerate that. Because, in fact, we, sh we, we, ha we do have a right to know much more than we know now, and we should demand that sort of knowledge. Uh, what exactly I think that we should be asking our, our, our governments and the companies that hand over data to them? Essential thing is who? Who are they in the jungle? Because we still don't know. We know that there is some cooperation between US intelligence and European intelligence, but we really don't know who are the observers. We don't know how often they ask. We don't know what they ask for. So is it going very deep? Is it just our IP numbers? Or is it our history of uh, all interactions online? Is it our search queries? Is it our list of contacts? Uh, is, it, uh, is it what we do online? There is so much data out there, and we don't know to what extent this data being, is being used. But uh, in a, in the, the, the worst thing is that we don't know why it happens. We don't really know who is targeted and for what reasons. So my point would be that that knowledge is essential and we should fight for it for, for, for one major reason. Namely, there is a lot, a lot, a lot that can be said about us on the basis of what we do online. How many of you recognize that picture? It's, it's dark, but I can see that quite a few. It's, it's a M M Michael Crail and a data, open data city um, project using data um, given to them by, or well, basically, using data that a German politician Malte Spitz took from telecom companies a few years back. And that data has been used by, by this open data community to show how much can be said just on the basis of our telecommunication so-called metadata. So not really the context of the communications, but the data about with whom we communicated, when, where we were. That all combined with uh, publicly available data about that particular politician basically helped these guys recreate a big piece of his, of his life. Now, very similar project by exactly the same people has been done um, using data uh, um, from both internet and telecoms for, for, for uh, Balthazar Gletli, um, um, Swiss politician. So the point I'm making here is that there is so much knowledge out there and we cannot really stop that knowledge being generated because that's where the way we live. But we should definitely work very hard to protect it and not give it away without a fight. And the first safeguard that I can think of is more transparency. If we know more about what's going on, we can probably identify issues, problems, threats much more effectively than now when we are lost uh, in this deep, deep forest. So the second argument that comes to my mind when I'm asking myself the question why we should fight for it is a legal argument that we actually have that kind of law already present in the European Union. Maybe many of you have heard about the Data Retention Directive. That's exactly the same one that has been, um, has been um, declared invalid by the European Court of Justice uh, a month ago. This is a wrong instrument, and we, we meaning digital rights organizations, we've been fighting with that for years. But even in that not very nice instrument, European Commission and other European institutions agreed that there has to be some transparency. So if member states use data retention, they have to declare, they have to report to the Commission once a year how many times they did it, 
for what purposes, in which cases it was used, and with what result. Because without that sort of data, you cannot really say whether a surveillance mechanism that you use works or whether it doesn't work. And this is something that gives us food for thought, because online, there is nothing similar. On one, online, we are really back to, to the wild, uh, because no, no such law exists, neither on, on, on European nor on, on national level. And that's something that really should be reconsidered. So back to Poland, to my country, sitting there, after Snowden revelations, we thought that we might well like to go deeper in this forest and check what is really happening on this intersection of internet and law enforcement. So we did a small survey, uh, a small case study. We decided to ask 10 major internet companies uh, basic questions. Basically, who asked them for, for our meaning citizen da citizens' data, uh, whether they, they gave this data or whether they refused, uh, what cases it concerned, Mm, who are the authorities, uh, what were the purposes, basic stuff. Still building on that presumption that if it was possible for telecommunication data, it should also be uh, feasible for internet data. The same questions, just changing the verbs from, from, from receiving to send, we, we ask to the authorities themselves. So to nine intelligence agencies that we have um, in Poland and to, to, to police. Mm, we couldn't ask prosecutions and we couldn't ask courts because there are very many of them and we could never send all these FOIA requests, uh, at least not in six months that we were dealing with this little survey. But we sent some. And, well, what have we learned? It was a very interesting experience because after six months we, reali we, we realized that indeed we are going in a very deep forest where nobody, uh, and at least not very many companies, are willing to talk to us because they are too, too, too afraid that we will interpret this against them, that users, by discovering more and more what's going on, they will lose trust. So only four companies eventually gave us the data we wanted, not even full data. And what we discovered on the face of it, you see here, it was quite obvious result, just seeing that with every month there is more requests um, about internet users, probably because more and more of our life is moving online and therefore there are more excuses or more cases uh, to, to, to ask. But what was much more interesting, when we look deeper, was the, were the reactions of these companies. So how many times they responded positively to this request? How many times they actually disclosed our data? And that was something that gave us very different results. As you can see, one company fulfilled almost all requests, while another company didn't fulfill even 20%. Why so? How this is possible? Simply because Polish law, and from what I know many other legal regimes, does not give a clear standard for the companies where they have to comply and where they have to say yes to such requests coming from law enforcement or coming from, from intelligence. As a result, it's for the companies to decide what standards they apply. Mm. As a matter of fact, it will be the companies defining the level of protection, not the law. This is something we feel that definitely should be changed uh, because it cannot be like that. We cannot trust them so much. Another interesting um, discovery, and that will be the last I will talk about now, but you can read more in the report that I left for you uh, on the back or, or online if you like, uh, it's analysis of who has been asking. We asked, as I said, both the companies and the authorities, and the answers were quite coherent. Everybody agreed or told us that the great majority of the requests came from law enforcement, namely police or prosecution, and not from intelligence. The very tiny dot uh, on, on the left uh, is intelligence. If we can trust this data, if we can trust this data, it's quite reassuring, basically saying that we are mostly dealing with law enforcement in Europe or in Poland and not with uh, big scandals like NSA, but that's all what they declare, what they give to us uh, um, and we cannot have the guarantee that something is not hidden uh, behind. Uh, the same questions asked to, uh, to, 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 to public authorities gave us, as I said before, similar results, but the big question mark comes from the fact that police refused to give its data, so we could only interpret this correlation from just comparing the numbers, that in both cases, talking about intelligence, we had quite small numbers, not the big numbers we, we expected or we feared that we might, we might have them. But interestingly enough, it, were, it was the intelligence that gave us more data when asked than police. Well, okay, so we got some numbers and it was quite an exciting process of collecting it, analyzing and discovering how many obstacles there were 
inside of this process. But do we really understand the world better having these numbers? For me, this little experiment was um, all the more interesting that I came to the conclusion that not really. We still, obviously, we still don't have the, 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 the answers to the most relevant questions, the same ones that I asked when we were still in the jungle. We still don't know what's happening behind the scenes, what's, uh, why, why these people are asking, why these authorities are asking these questions, how deep this, 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 these questions go inside of our privacy, uh, what, what kind of cooperation mechanisms, mechanisms are behind it. All this was secret, all this was refused to us by both the companies and, and the public authorities. So my point is that we shouldn't, really, uh, we shouldn't really let them fool us with their numbers. We shouldn't really feel much more comfortable having all these names of programs used by NSA and having all these numbers that are co coming up from various transparency reports or collecting these numbers ourselves. Because the key questions are still hidden from us. Uh, therefore, our report the one that, that I, I gave you here, uh, focuses less on data and more on the problems. The problems that we actually know, that we have known them before, we know them now, and they don't change. They don't really change since I started my work uh, in this field. And when I speak to other colleagues, they also talk about the same, about lack of oversight, lack of mechanisms that would allow us citizens verify whether we are under surveillance, lack of mechanisms that, that enable Parliamentarian, parliamentarian uh, commissions or, or DPAs, data protection authorities or ombudsmen or anybody else go inside of the surveillance matrix to check what's going on there. This is something that has to be repaired not only in Europe but, but, but beyond. There are also loopholes, very interesting loopholes that can be used and abused not only by state but also by private actors. I'm sure that you heard of copyright trolling or maybe even you received letters from, from, from law firms that claim that you downloaded illegally or allegedly you downloaded something illegal from the net and on the basis of, of your IP number they claim that you should, you should pay them money. This is all done on the basis of this data. At least in Poland they use police and, and prosecution to get this sort of data about internet users and then abuse this data in order to blackmail us into paying money that we shouldn't pay. Uh, so all these safeguards are missing and this is something we have to face as citizens, not getting stuck with the numbers uh, and, uh, and then the, the nice things you can, you, can, you can do with them. So the question that I want to ask to you basically uh, is are there any real solutions that we can think of together? Where do we start? When I've read the speaker's guidelines for this conference, the organizer said solutions are something we look for, of course, but this is the trickiest issue. Does anyone have the answer? This is, this, is, this is tricky, isn't it? So maybe this is the time where we could talk if we still have some time. Where do we start? Do we start with companies? Do we expect more from companies, more transparency, less cooperation, maybe less data collection in the first place? Or do we start with changing our governments? Can we change them? Do you think that if we change governments, law enforcement and intelligence will stop working the way it works now, will be more transparent? Or is it something that doesn't change regardless of political power? What do you think? Uh, I invite you to talk. This is your time now. Thank you. Irgendwelche Fragen jetzt hier aus dem Publikum? Was? Comments, please. Hm. Uh, hatten, hattet ihr das jetzt gerade gehört? Oder? Nee? Okay. Also wenn es Fragen gibt, wir haben auf jeden Fall noch ein Mikro. Um, can you hear me? Yes. It feels weird, doesn't uh, it? <laughs> I think it's, I think it's um, uh, probably too late to, um, uh, to get all the data back because it's already in the wild, as it's called. Exactly. So I think 
we as the public should demand for the data to be, um, to be, to be made open so we can see them and read them and maybe uh, influence what is done with them. I see another problem there, and that is not only the collection of data, but what you can do with the data. You know, all the algorithms that, that maybe companies or um, governments uh, or other organizations have devel developed to work with our data. And I really don't know what, I don't even know what to ask for about this, uh, this kind of stuff. But I think the first step should be that, uh, that everybody should publish which data they have. That is something well, that, we, that we maybe have to work uh, um, for in NGOs or as voters or, you know, publishers, whatever. Hmm. Thank you. It's an interesting comment. Uh, there is even this concept of fighting surveillance with more transparency. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting uh, point of view and there is even this concept of fighting surveillance with more data. I mean, if everybody, if everybody knows basically everything about everybody, then we might have less surveillance, at least less power, more power balance, so to say. I, to, what, to some extent, I like this idea, and I do think we should always, and therefore I'm speaking today about this particular topic, we should always demand more transparency from those who have data on us. That goes without saying. There is because this is the only way for us to discover potential abuses or potential problems that are hidden there. But whether our transparency would help that process, that here I'm not sure. We will always have much less ability to deal with this data than, say, uh, Google or NSA or any other government. And therefore, this is only theoretical balance if everybody knows every, everything, right? The processing power and the algorithms that we have at hand, they, they, they do differ. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can great. see you, though. Listen, I'm... Oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for raising these issues and giving your talk. I, I've appreciated it. I've got one comment, um, and I'm coming from it from a slightly different angle rather than demand, that we demand transparency. I don't think the nature of modern information uh, storage and flow allows for that anymore. And what I mean by that is organisational motives now want data. They want to churn data, they want to analyse it, they want to, to profile big data over large assumptions being made in all sorts of areas. So I don't think demands of transparencies are going to work anymore. But on the positive side, I'd like to start to suggest an alternative. But this is going to involve a cultural change. One of the things we should start thinking about is everyone is going to have to start to be, and excuse the metaphor, their own private firewall. They are going to have to be their own data managers. And I, I like the idea of flipping technology around, uh, enabling, you know, from the media revolution with PCs allowing everyone to make films now, everyone can be their own security infrastructure as well as um, the corporations who, who hide these databases from the people and certainly hide what analysis, analyses they do with it. Um, one interesting project, and might be related as well, uh, that is open source, is a project called Multigo. Multigo is a data... Yep, you may have heard of it. Great, fantastic. It's a data analysis engine, and I promote everyone to start analysing data to themselves. In other words, I, I wonder whether there's a cultural change and a shift that can happen in the way that we handle and manage our own information and start to search back and correlate back ourselves in the way that we can. We will never have the resources of the NSA individually and we will never have the resources of large governments, whether good or bad in nature. But maybe, maybe, if we just realise what we can do both individually and collectively in data management ourselves, we can start to address some of these issues. Mm. So you would go up for individual strategies rather than trying to change the law or introduce more... In, individuals and groups, I think, because, mm. you know, like a lot of the other uh, topics uh, in this conference, from crowdfunding to others, individuals all doing this and starting to go down this journey, starting to forge a track through that wilderness. At least realise how exactly. much wealth you give out. Exactly. No, yeah. I, I completely and agree. There may be other measures as well, but that's one I want to bring to the table. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Just don't get me wrong, I would never ever make that point that transparency solves the thing. I even uh, somehow attacked this, this, this uh, illusion that having more data solves any of the problems, because it does not. We do need 
in my opinion, we do need both. We need strong legal safeguards, so legal solutions that will prevent these abuses from happening and bring more transparency for us, but that's, that's the state or, or company is doing for us. But on the other hand, I'm completely with you. Uh, on that page, we should work individually, but that's, say, Jake and Gillian were just speaking about PGP next door. This is the kind of tactics that I use personally and I recommend everybody to use because there's no other way. Nobody will do it for us, that's for sure. Any further comments? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Mike, I'm from Poland, um, about the transparency voice and, and I, was, uh, I, I would just like to say something about using the word transparency with regard to private data. This feels really weird with this uh, thing, sorry. Uh, I think that we should not use the word transparency in the context of our private data. Transpar the word transparency and the word accountability are extremely important in the context of uh, governments in the context of in the context of uh, institutions in the context of corporations in the context of anything that is uh, big powerful and and institu in institutionalized right uh, but as soon as we start using the word transparency or accountability in the, with the, with regard to private data we are starting to muddy the waters between two different discussions between the discussion of uh, being able to hold accountable institutions, corporations, governments, etc., and the discussion of uh, us being able to defend ourselves against those kinds of entities, right? So I would. Um, um, this is something that shows up sometimes, and I'm 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 not saying that uh, that it was um, uh, it was uh, on purpose, of course, right? But I'm just I'm just saying that we should be very careful not to not to muddy the waters and mix the two discussions because are, they are very different. And if, if we let those two discussions mix, we will end, uh, we'll, we will end up in a situation where we, where we will not be able to argue uh, in either of those discussions the way we would want, right? Uh, the way that would make our private da data, uh, data private, and on the other hand, that would make uh, corporate, government, etc. data uh, available for us to, to look into and make, those, uh, make their decisions, make their actions transparent. Thank you. Cannot agree more. Thanks for that great comment. Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I, I saw there's, there's one more question and there was another one, but we, ha we have the problem that um, right now, the next, maybe in the next two minutes, the, ne the next session will, will be here on the Maybe stage. just the last one and then the final I will take at the door. No, I, I would really, I would really, I, I'm very okay. sorry. I'm really sorry for this because it's really, you know, our, our timetable is incredible. So, um, but you are, you are still here and you wanted I'm to give... To give uh, something to the to the um, listeners, and so you you might maybe answer the questions outside. I'm, I'm sure, so you can sorry. Grab me there, and there are um, these reports I mentioned are, are, are yeah. sitting behind you. So if you feel like taking them or finding them them on them online, it's all available. But you can also grab me while I'm here in person. Thank you so much for the good discussion.